South Carolina. The Lone Star Ranger by Zane Gray. The last chapter twenty five. Light shone before Duane's eyes, thick, strange light that came and went. For a long time dull and booming sounds rushed by, filling all. It was a dream in which there was nothing, a drifting under a burden, darkness, light, sound, movement, and vague, obscure sense of time, time that was very long. There was fire, creeping, consuming fire. A dark cloud of flame enveloped him, rolled him away. He saw, then, dimly, a room that was strange, strange people moving about over him, with faint voices, far away, things in a dream. He saw again, clearly, and consciousness returned, still unreal, still strange, full of those vague and far-away things. Then he was not dead. He lay stiff, like a stone, with a weight ponderous as a mountain upon him, and all his bound body racked in slow, dull-beating agony. A woman's face hovered over him, white and tragic-eyed, like one of his old haunting phantoms, yet sweet and eloquent. Then a man's face bent over him, looked deep into his eyes, and seemed to whisper from a distance, Duane! Duane! Ah! He knew me! After that there was another long interval of darkness. When the light came again, clearer this time, the same earnest-faced man bent over him. It was MacNelly, and with recognition the past flooded back. Duane tried to speak. His lips were weak, and he could scarcely move them. Poggin, he whispered. His first real conscious thought was for Poggin, ruling passion eternal instinct. "'Poggin is dead, Duane, shot to pieces,' replied MacNelly, solemnly. "'What a fight he made! He killed two of my men, wounded others. God, he was a tiger! He used up three guns before we downed him.' "'Who got away?' "'Fletcher, the man with the horses.' We downed all the others. Duane, the job's done. It's done. Why, man, you're... What of... of... her? Miss Longstreth has been almost constantly at your bedside. She helped the doctor. She watched your wounds. And, and Duane, the other night, when you sank low, so low, I think it was her spirit that held yours back. Oh, she's a wonderful girl. Duane, she never gave up, never lost her nerve for a moment. Well, we're going to take you home, and she'll go with us. Colonel Longstreth left for Louisiana right after the fight. I advised it. There was great excitement. It was best for him to leave. Have, have I a chance to recover? Chance? Why, man, exclaimed the captain, You'll get well. You'll pack a sight of lead all your life, but you can stand that. Duane, the whole Southwest knows your story. You need never again be ashamed of the name Buck Duane. The brand outlaw is washed out. Texas believes you've been a secret ranger all the time. You're a hero. And now think of home, your mother, of this noble girl, of your future. The rangers took Duane home to Wellston. A railroad had been built since Duane had gone into exile. Wellston had grown. A noisy crowd surrounded the station, but it stilled as Duane was carried from the train. A sea of faces pressed close. Some were faces he remembered, schoolmates, friends, old neighbors. There was an upflinging of many hands. Duane was being welcomed home to the town from which he had fled. A deadness within him broke. This welcome hurt him somehow, quickened him, and through his cold being 
his weary mind, passed a change. His sight dimmed. Then there was a white house, his old home. How strange, yet how real! His heart beat fast. Had so many, many years passed. Familiar yet strange it was, and all seemed magnified. They carried him in, these ranger comrades, and laid him down, and lifted his head upon pillows. The house was still, though full of people. Duane's gaze sought the open door. Someone entered, a tall girl in white, with dark, wet eyes and a light upon her face. She was leading an old lady, gray-haired, austere-faced, somber and sad. His mother. She was feeble, but she walked erect. She was pale, shaking, yet maintained her dignity. The someone in white uttered a low cry and knelt by Duane's bed. His mother flung wide her arms with a strange gesture. "'This man! They've not brought back my boy! This man's his father! Where is my son? My son! Oh, my son!' When Twain grew stronger, it was a pleasure to lie by the west window and watch Uncle Jim whittle his stick and listen to his talk. The old man was broken now. He told many interesting things about people Duane had known, people who had grown up and married, failed, succeeded, gone away, and died. But it was hard to keep Uncle Jim off the subject of guns, outlaws, fights. He could not seem to divine how mention of these things hurt Duane. Uncle Jim was childish now, and he had a great pride in his nephew. He wanted to hear of all of Duane's exile. And if there was one thing more than another that pleased him, it was to talk about the bullets which Duane carried in his body. Five bullets, ain't it? he asked for the hundredth time. Five in that last scrap. By gum! And you had six before? Yes, uncle, replied Duane. Five and six. That makes eleven. By gum! A man's a man to carry all that lead. But, Buck, you could carry more. There's that nigger Edwards right here in Wellston. He's got a ton of bullets in him. Doesn't seem to mind them none. And there's Cole Miller. I've seen him. Been a bad man in his day. They say he packs twenty-three bullets. But he's bigger than you. Got more flesh. Funny, wasn't it, Buck? about the doctor only being able to cut one bullet out of you, that one in your breastbone? It was a forty-one caliber, an unusual cartridge. I saw it, and I wanted it, but Miss Longstreth wouldn't part with it. Buck, there was a bullet left in one of Poggins's guns, and that bullet was the same kind as the one cut out of you. By gum! boy it had killed you if it stayed there it would indeed uncle replied duane and the old haunting somber mood returned but duane was not often at the mercy of childish old hero-worshipping uncle jim miss longstreth was the only person who seemed to divine duane's gloomy mood and when she was with him she warded off all suggestion one afternoon, while she was there at the west window, a message came for him. They read it together. You have saved the ranger service to the Lone Star State. Signed, McNelly. Ray knelt beside him at the window, and he believed she meant to speak then of the thing they had shunned. Her face was still white, but sweeter now warm with rich life beneath the marble, and her dark eyes were still intent, still haunted by shadows, but no longer tragic. 
"'I'm glad for MacNelly's sake as well as the State's,' said Duane. She made no reply to that, and seemed to be thinking deeply. Duane shrank a little. "'The pain? Is it any worse to-day?' she asked, instantly. "'No. It's the same. It will always be the same. I'm full of lead, you know. But I don't mind a little pain.' "'Then it's the old mood, the fear?' she whispered. "'Tell me.' "'Yes, it haunts me. I'll be well soon, able to go out. Then that—that that hell will come back.' "'No, no,' she said with emotion. "'Some drunken cowboy, some fool with a gun, will hunt me out in every town, wherever I go. He went on miserably. Buck Duane, to kill Buck Duane. Hush! Don't speak so. Listen, you remember that day in Val Verde, when I came to you, plead with you not to meet Poggin? Oh, that was a terrible hour for me. But it showed me the truth. I saw the struggle between your passion to kill and your love for me. I could have saved you then had I known what I know now. Now I understand that, that thing which haunts you. But you'll never have to draw again. You'll never have to kill another man, thank God. Like a drowning man he would have grasped at straws, but he could not voice his passionate query. She put tender arms round his neck. "'Because you'll have me with you always,' she replied. "'Because always I shall be between you and that—that that terrible thing.' It seemed with the spoken thought absolute assurance of her power came to her. Twain realized instantly that he was in the arms of a stronger woman than she who had pled with him that fatal day. "'We'll—' We'll be married and leave Texas," she said softly, with the red blood rising rich and dark in her cheeks. Ray. Yes, we will, though you're laggard in asking me, sir. But, dear, suppose, he replied huskily, suppose there might be, be children, a, a boy, a boy with his father's blood. I pray God there will be. I do not fear what you fear, but even so he'll be half my blood." Duane felt the storm rise and break in him, and his terror was that of joy, quelling fear. The shining glory of love in this woman's eyes made him weak as a child. How could she love him? How could she so bravely face a future with him? Yet she held him in her arms, twining her hands round his neck and pressing close to him. Her faith and love and beauty, these she meant to throw between him and all that terrible past. They were her power, and she meant to use them all. He dared not think of accepting her sacrifice. But, Ray, you dear noble girl, I'm poor. I have nothing and I'm a cripple. Oh, you'll be well some day, she replied. And listen, I have money. My mother left me well off. All she had was her father's. Do you understand? We'll take Uncle Jim and your mother. We'll go to Louisiana, to my old home. It's far from here. There's a plantation to work. There are horses and cattle a great cypress forest to cut. Oh, you'll have much to do. You'll forget there. You'll learn to love my home. It's a beautiful old place. There are groves where the gray moss blows all day, and the nightingales sing all night. My darling, cried Duane brokenly, no, no, no. Yet he knew in his heart that he was yielding to her that he could not resist her a moment longer. What was this madness of love? 
we'll be happy she whispered oh i know come 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 her eyes were closing heavy lidded and she lifted sweet tremulous waiting lips with bursting heart duane bent to them then he held her close pressed to him while with dim eyes he looked out over the line of low hills in the west down where the sun was setting gold and red down over the new seas and the wild breaks of the rio grande which he was never to see again it was in this solemn and exalted moment that duane accepted happiness and faced a new life trusting this brave and tender woman to be stronger than the dark and fateful passion that had shadowed his past it would come back that wind of flame that madness to forget that driving relentless instinct for blood it would come back with those pale drifting haunting faces and the accusing fading eyes but all his life always between them and him rendering them powerless would be the faith and love and beauty of this noble woman end of chapter end of book thank you for listening